you to Stephen Fry for those beautiful words. That's humanism. What makes something right or wrong? I'm going to play a track now by a humanist artist, because I do love music. This is a track called Good Bayesian. It's by Barbara Brinkman. And again, I still seem to be having some technical issues from my last show that I can't quite figure out what's happening. So let me try a different way to play this track. This may take some time, so I'll just mumble away. So if you have any questions about um, humanism or atheism and want to chat, I think my email address is on the website. So feel free to go onto the Arrow FM website and have a listen. Right, I've got some Barbara Brickman here. This is a track called Memes Up. Let's try this one and hopefully it plays. I kick flows for you, deliver info for you. Obstacles to thought, get rid of those for you. How can a protozoa develop into a lawyer without any supernatural magic? Just let me show you. Evolution is blind and kind of ruthless It finds designs by trying different types of mutants Mindless movements randomly finding uses As if the only way to get around to fit the music Was to write a billion versions of a verse with tiny variations And play them back to see what difference each difference is making Stepwise exploration of design spaces With a lot fewer ways to love it than hate it We got a special kind of brain as homo sapiens Genetic variation is such a slow way to change it Now that we can get in Infected and enculturated with memes The pace of evolution is getting crazy So get your memes up Try to read stuff If you don't read, get a book on speaker If you wanna be a true seeker Get some memes up in your cerebrum Get your memes up Try to see stuff If you can't travel, get on Wikipedia Get it from a teacher A social media Get your memes up if you want freedom Ever since the beginning of multicellularity Evolution tended to favor one of two strategies Either anchor your body in place like clams and trees Or navigate actively like salmon and geese Humans and fleas Navigators need to have a brain to chase prey and evade danger A brain is a control center Action taker but it never was a generator of thoughts that came later When a certain animal evolved a certain talent Recursive language, abstract words and grammar The ability to turn in words and sample the inner channel Which in turn turned to cinematic You've been collecting memes since you were just a kid That's how you can speak and know the date and do arithmetic That's what recognition is If your consciousness is rich It's a list of memes that your brain has been infected with so Get your memes up Try to read stuff If you don't read, get a book on speaker If you wanna be a true seeker Get some memes up in your cerebrum Get your memes up Try to see stuff If you can't travel, get on Wikipedia Get it from a teacher A social media Get your memes up If you want freedom Freedom from automatic action By any means Memes will set you free But not just any memes Beautiful memes Give us true beliefs False beliefs take away freedom like skinny jeans That's what it means to know what you're doing With a ready explanation for any questioning human A reason that's not a reason discovered by evolution A reason represented in a mind, that's a new one My daughter's three years old, she's given limited freedom Citizenship is restricted when you're deficient in reason But she's got a brain that's voracious for taking memes in So she's getting more and more conscious with every season You can't do much work with your bare hands, love and your bare their brain isn't equipped to understand much You can either live in a state of incomprehension Or actively get your memes jacked up So get your memes up Try to read stuff If you don't read, get a book on speaker If you wanna be a true seeker Get some memes up in your cerebrum Get your memes up Try to see stuff If you can't travel, get on Wikipedia Get it from a teacher a social media, get your memes up if you want freedom. Get your memes up, 
Try to read stuff if you don't read Get a book on speaker If you wanna be a truth seeker Get some memes up in your cerebrum Get your memes up Try to see stuff If you can't travel Get on Wikipedia Get it from a teacher Or social media Get your memes up If you want freedom That was a track by Barbara Brinkman called Memes Up. A lovely track about, well, you heard it. So um, I'm going to read now a release by from September 2000. September, uh, I can't talk. It's Sunday night, what can I say? Long weekend. So a press release from the Humanists of New Zealand Humanists from September 24th, 2019. No religion overtakes Christianity in 2018 census results. So humanists are calling to the end of concessions afforded to Christian groups as the number of non-religious people overtakes all other belief groups in New Zealand combined. This week, the release of data from the latest census has confirmed the New Zealand's Sorry, has confirmed that New Zealand's non-religious population continues to grow, with 48% of the population now identifying as non-religious. This makes no religion the largest belief group in New Zealand. However, Humanist New Zealand says the public policy fails to recognise the growth of non-religious beliefs, and it's calling on the government to end the privileges awarded. I'm having talking troubles today. It's calling on the government to end the privileges awarded to religious groups. Humanist New Zealand President Jolene Phipps states, Christianity has a privileged position in public policy today that is out of step with modern New Zealand. From parliamentary prayers to classrooms closing, in quotation marks, that you can't see my fingers doing quotation marks because it's the radio, unless you're watching online in case, hello, you can see my fingers doing quotation marks. Anyway, to classrooms closing during the school day so Christian groups can run religious instruction, the concessions awarded to religious organisations clash with human rights and our concept of a free and fair society. Humanist New Zealand is calling for an end to the discrimination non-religious New Zealanders face. In our hospitals, 10 Christian churches get 100% of the funding for chaplaincy, pastoral and spiritual growth from the Ministry of Health, FIP states. Religious groups are awarded charity status and tax exemptions just for promoting religion. Non-religious people need more recognition, support, services and representation. We want to work together to ensure our voices are heard. I'm going to drop to another track now. This is by one of my favourite artists. I saw him play in... Wellington about two years ago. Let's hope that this one actually plays. This is a track by Tim Minchin. It's his Christmas song, White Wine in the Sun. I know it's March, right? It's not Christmas, but White Wine in the Sun, what better term is that for a New Zealand summer sitting in the sun, white wine, or red, or single what with in fact anything you want, right? Drink any wine you want. We played the song Mum um loved Tim Minchin as well. And this was the first song of his she heard, and it made her fall in love with him, which is all good. So we played it at her funeral, and everyone cried, and it was a fantastic funeral, and that's all good. Here's White Wine in the Sun by Tim Minchin. I'm looking forward to Christmas It's sentimental, I know But I just really like it I am hardly religious I'd rather break bread with Dawkins than Desmond too, too, to be honest And yes, I have all of the usual objections to consumerism To the commercialization of an ancient religion to the westernization of a dead Palestinian press ganged into selling playstations and beer But I still really like him I'm looking forward to Christmas Though I'm not expecting a visit from Jesus I'll be seeing my dad My brother and sisters My gran and my mom 
They'll be drinking white wine in the sun I'll be seeing my dad My brother and sisters, my gran and my mum They'll be drinking white wine in the sun I don't go in for ancient wisdom I don't believe just cause ideas are tenacious It means that they're worthy I get freaked out by churches Some of the hymns that they sing have nice chords But the lyrics are dodgy and yes, I have all of the usual objections to the miseducation of children who in tax-exempt institutions are taught to externalize blame and to feel ashamed and to judge things as plain right or wrong. But I quite like the songs. Not expecting big presents The old combination of socks, jocks and chocolates is just fine by me Cause I'll be seeing my dad My brother and sisters, my gran and my mum They'll be drinking white wine in the sun I'll be seeing my dad, my brother and sisters, my gran and my mum. They'll be drinking white wine in the sun. And you, my baby girl, my jet lagged infant daughter, you'll be handed round the room. Like a puppy at a primary school And you won't understand But you will learn someday That wherever you are and whatever you face These are the people who make you feel safe in this world My sweet blue-eyed girl my baby girl When you're 21 or 31 And Christmas comes around And you find yourself 9,000 miles from home You'll know whatever comes Your brothers and sisters And me and your mom We'll be waiting for you in the sun When Christmas comes Your brothers and sisters, your aunts and your uncles Your grandparents, cousins and me and your mom We'll be waiting for you in the sun Drinking white wine in the sun Darling, whenever you come We'll be waiting for you in the sun Drinking white wine in the sun Waiting for you in the sun Waiting Ah really like Christmas It's sentimental, I know Thank you. Thank you, Ginger Alcoholic. Thank you, Drunk Passionate Lady. Thank you, people up the back. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jules. Thank you, Orchestra. Thank you, ball boys. Good night.
You can't really go wrong with Tim Minchin, eh? All his songs are superb. So that was a song called White Wine and Sun. Sort of a nice Southern Hemisphere Christmas. I'm going to play now, hopefully this works, a interview that Richard Dawkins did. He interviewed Saudi Arabian atheist author Rana Amhad, who wrote a book about atheism, published, I believe, in... I think it's in German and French. And, well, I guess you'll get to listen to the interview, so I won't do any spoilers and things like that. I'm hoping on the show regularly to have things like interviews by other people, talking about the clergy project, talking about secular education network, and lots of other interviews and things, so it's not my voice coming through. So as this show develops with the once a month scheduling, we're going to build all of those interesting things into it. The clergy project is interesting as well. I'm going to talk about them a little bit after this interview by Richard Dawkins. So enjoy. Rana, it's a great pleasure to meet you finally personally, having read and greatly admired you from having read your book, an early draft of your book, mm -hmm. Women are not allowed to dream. Coming from Saudi Arabia, I have the impression that unless you're rich and male, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is not a very nice place to live. Is that a fair uh, assessment? Yeah, li like a woman and also like a theist is like the most worst place to live. Um, for women, we don't have any dream there. We all that time independent of about our family. My father, my brother, my husband. It's like I, I can't do anything in this country. I need all that time the permission from them. Um, and even if if my situation is really bad, if I get hit or if I have like something bad with my family, I can't call the police or ask for help. Yes. Yeah. And when you were not allowed to dream, what dreams did you actually have? First. Did you did you dream to come to a free country? Yeah, to live in a free country, to have my freedom life, to be an atheist and not to behave like I am a Muslim, but from inside I am atheist. To respect me, I don't want to believe in any kind of religion or God. I want to live like in peace without any forcing to be someone else and to study nuclear physics, to meet you and yeah. Now, is it right to say that you didn't really know that there was such a thing as an atheist, that it was possible to be an atheist when yeah. you were growing up? I was completely shocked when I saw the word atheist in, in English. I take it to Google and I translate it to Arabic and even in Arabic language what does mean mulhid, that's what I did. And then I search and then I was completely shocked. There is people in our life, they don't believe in, in, in God or they don't have any religion. It's like something so huge for me. It was impossible to believe that anybody could yeah. not believe in God. Yeah. And from this moment I start to search and in our Arabic uh, um, Twitter or Facebook or media if you start to search about atheists the first uh, su suggest or the first book you they put it you have to read it it's your book uh, God Delusion. And you yeah. read that in Arabic? I read it in Arabic. Uh, it was like it's illegal to have it. Even to download it, I have to change my VPN and I make like trip to get the book. And when I get the book, I, I download it in my laptop and then I put it in my, my flash memory. And I keep my flash memory it's like drugs or something really dangerous. And I was when I read it in my room, I close the door, I bought something from the door and I open my laptop and I start to read, read, read. <laughs> <laughs> what would have happened to you if you'd been caught reading it? Uh, my family really struck with religion. They were not even because the name in Arabic, God delusion. It's if someone see it from my family, uh, I think they will be like hit and they they take all my contact laptop uh, handy or anything like from this and I will be isolated in in the house and I will not allow to go out or to contact anyone until they be sure that I am Muslim and they don't have any other idea. Do you still feel threatened even living in Germany? Yeah, threatened because I talk about free freedom of religion and I talk about human rights. It's coming from the people they are living here in Germany. They are also refugee. They come from the other country. Yeah. So you are being threatened by fellow refugees who have yeah. who have come out of Islamic countries and they yeah. come to a free country, Germany, yeah. and they still threaten you? Yeah. 
because I talk about this topic in, uh, in, in Arabic language and other language and I am really like support women to be free also not only, not only because of the religion. So these refugees in Germany who threaten you do they not realize they're now living in a free country? I think they don't want to, to realize that. They want to stay in the same idea. Why don't they go back home? <laughs> it's not my decision. No. I hope they will be really struck with this kind of people. When, when I see people, they, they threat the other and they are dangerous and they don't respect the freedom. They don't respect the right here. Why, are, why they are here? Uh, do your family know where you are? Uh, they know that I am in, in Germany, but they don't know which city. So do you keep that secret? Yeah, and also I block my information with the help with police and the immigration office here. So anyone who take my name and try to find where I am live, he, he can't. And what would happen to you if they did find where you are? Um, before three or two weeks I get information that my brother tried to find someone by dark net to kill me here in Germany. To kill you? Yeah. Your because brother, your yeah, own brother would kill you? My own brother. I, it was like, I was completely uh, sad. I, I was crying when I go to the police. I'm not surprised. Yeah, and I, I, I make like complaint and she's, I see his name in the beginning like really like a criminal and this like so much it was so feel for, for me. Did you love your brother when you were in yeah, Saudi Arabia? Yeah, before, before I become an atheist and before everything in my mind changed, we was really close, your sister and brother. We was talking, getting to a restaurant, doing like something together. But after I move and after I start my life here, he not accept that, I bring the shame for the family. That is incredibly sad. Yeah. And it's really troubling that a belief, a religious yeah. belief, can actually take over somebody's mind, can parasitize yeah. somebody's mind to the extent that he would kill his own, his want to kill his own beloved sister. Mm -hmm. That is deeply disturbing and it just shows the power, the evil power yeah. that Already, religion yeah. can exert over a vulnerable human mind. I'm shocked by that. Right. And I'm, I'm very sorry for you, but I greatly admire your courage, the courage with which you are standing up to this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. At present, your book, A Woman Is Not Allowed to Dream, mm. is only published in German and what other languages? And France. And French. It's yeah. German and French. Uh, not in Arabic. Not in Arabic, yeah. Uh, well, not English. Not English. Until um, now, it seems to me a great pity that it's not published in English. Mm -hmm. um, how well has it sold in the German edition? It was like the bestseller in Spiegel bestseller. A Spiegel bestseller. Yeah, it was in the four, three, four, five months. In the beginning, was bestseller. Well, then it must be published in English. Yeah, oh, that's that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. so. Uh, we must tr try to make efforts to find an, a, an English publisher mm -hmm. of, a, of a bestseller in Spiegel. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations on that. Yeah. What about other languages? Um, you know, if there is like publisher house, they get interesting about my story, they contact me or contact my agent or contact my publisher house in Germany. Yes. And we start to make to, to deal with that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, other languages other than English you haven't thought you haven't tried yet or, or um i think they try uh, for all the language but now we are successful with the france and i th i think also it will be in Ch uh, czech republic i don't okay. know i'm not really sure right yeah. um what about other languages spoken in the islamic world like indonesian urdu farsi that kind of thing um maybe it's I think it's important because of my, my story or my book. Um, I met two Saudi women here in Germany and they told me after we get touch in your story and we see you on the internet or we see your video, we have the power to get out from our country and be free like you. And I think if, if you read my book, you really be touched and if the women like they are afraid or they are, they think we can't change our life, we can't do anything and we have to accept this kind of uh, society and we have to accept what they want from us. But you see, it's, it's possible, it's not something really, yes. yeah. So if we think back to your time in Saudi Arabia and other Islamic countries, um, I'm sure you're not alone, there must be lots of others like yeah. you. 
uh, who would who need to escape. Yeah. Um, do you have some sense of how many atheists there might be in Saudi Arabia? Um, it's not impossible to know, of course, but but. Um, did you talk to any of your friends while he was there? I about think it? a lot, but we can we can really be sure because they can show them identity or we, they can it said uh, we are atheists. I think we I can say like three or four millions. We can we can say. Well, we we know, don't we, that the Arabic translation of the God Delusion, which you read mm -hmm. in uh, you downloaded, mm -hmm. has been downloaded. I think thirteen million times. Wow. Um, the Arabic translation, yeah. and I think three million of those in Saudi Arabia, which is a very significant figure. Yeah, yeah. Which does suggest something very encouraging. And I've heard similar stories from Iran, mm -hmm. uh, that there's a very large groundswell, a very large underground mm -hmm. of non-religious people because in Iran. For us, if you, start to, 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 if you start to search, or if you start to open your mind and to know other kind of thought, you will start with important book. And for, for us, it was like really your book in the beginning. And I think also in Iran, if they want to start with the book, they start with God Delusion also. Yes. Well, the Richard Dawkins Foundation is uh, starting a new project mm -hmm. to translate several of my books, not just the God Delusion, mm -hmm. into Arabic, Farsi, Indonesian, and Urdu yeah. uh, for free download. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, not to be published as, as pa paper books, but but to be to be downloaded free so we hope that that will help yeah. people who were who still are in the predicament that you were in so thank you very much thank you so that was richard dawkins interviewing saudi arabian atheist author rana ahmad who's in the horrible predicament of her brother as you probably heard I can't even say it out loud, but that's okay. So I did Google. Her book is still only available in English, sorry, in German and French. Sadly, it hasn't yet been translated and sold in English. I'm going to play a track now by Helen Arney called You, Me and Walt Disney. It's kind of a quirky, fun track. Then we're going to come back. I'm going to talk about the Clergy Project a little bit. So the Clergy Project, I'll give you a kind of teaser what it's like now. So the Clergy Project, if you can imagine, well, you probably don't need to imagine, there are lots of pastors and priests and priestesses and everything else who are employed by the church to run their churches some of them over time may lose faith in God and become atheists this presents quite a predicament for them because it's then hard to kind of leave the church and get a job and start a life outside the church so the clergy project is I believe a support group for people who that's happening to and there are a couple of stories on there by some of the ex-clergy talking about what they've gone through. So I'm going to read one of those and I'm going to try and interview them um, for an upcoming episode of this show as well because I think that'd be quite worthwhile too. In the meantime though, here's a track You, Me and Walt Disney by Helen Arney. both cryogenically frozen so it's you and me and Walt Disney and we're dancing and singing in the 25th century we're living the future held together by sutures ice cubes forming in our brains industrial antifreeze running through our veins so I've looked into this quite carefully it turns out there's a lot of contradiction Disney on ice isn't literal and that Episode of Doctor Who was fiction So it's you and me but no Walt Disney Just some baseball players and 70s hippies Don't shake their hands cause you've got more than you plan And please stop flirting with your great 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 granddaughter has friend Just want to seem too overjoyed, my love, but it's too late to get a refund. And the truth is that I never liked your body much, so I have only 
pay to get your head done Don't have a seizure It's just a reason So it's you and me in the 35th century I'll keep your brain in a mechanical jar On wheels first bionic, then bionic We will be together though Our sin will be like leather But at least we'll be together again Darling Some people say I've got more money than sense Truth is that I have neither I bought a package from some cut price cowboys in Russia Who didn't build a door for your freezer You are so lovely But your brain is slush for me So it's just me A minus 200 degrees I'm waiting for the 35th century I have no regrets Except not wearing a vest and Maybe I should just have bought you that discount home cremation kit instead So that was a track called You and Me and Walt Disney by Helen Arney. That kind of all rhymes, doesn't it? So in case you missed the intro to the show, this is a new show on Arrow FM looking at atheism and humanism and all those good secular non-religious things. My name's Tim. I'm a committee member of Humanists New Zealand. It's a charitable organisation, but this show is not sponsored or endorsed by them. It's me. They all know I'm doing it. I'm getting resources from them. They're all fantastic people. And we've got a meeting coming up. Um, it's on... Oh, I'm going to have to look up the date and time because I don't want to get you wrong on this one. It's at the end of this month. It's in Wellington. Come along. It'll be awesome. There's a guest speaker who's coming out from Auckland. It was supposed to be at the end of last month or a week ago, but because of lockdown, that didn't happen. So I'll look up the details and get them all to you soon. Now, the Clergy Project. So the Clergy Project, as I mentioned before, is supporting clergy members who want to, who have lost their religion, need to leave the church, and need to kind of get a, a secular life back again. I'm going to read the story by Michael Pleban. Um, I think Clergy Project are England-based as well, but I'm not quite sure about that. So I'm going to read his story. It's not overly long. And then I think I'm going to play another bit of music. I'm not quite sure what that's going to be yet, so we'll play that by ear a little bit. So this is Michael Pleaver, and it was written by Terry Plank back in 2018. Why did I stop believing in God? The shortest answer would be that I ran out of excuses for him. Pentecostal Christianity... Pentecostal Christianity, sorry, stresses that God is actively involved in the believers' lives, answering their prayers, communicating with them, and changing events around them. As a teenager, I loved this idea. I was raised in a traditional Catholicism where God, while powerful, was very distant. I always thought that if there is a God, I wanted to have close contact with him. I couldn't imagine any other way of living a meaningful life. But the dull Catholic liturgy, repeated week after week, did not provide me that. So when I found myself at a charismatic, joyous Pentecostal meeting, I knew immediately I discovered what was a religion for me. On that very day, I was baptised in the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. I never attended the Catholic Mass again, except for sporadic family, uh, except for sporadic family weddings, christening, christenings and funerals. I found a God who felt so close I could almost touch him, who was personally interested in what was happening with me, and who seemed to personally speak to me via the Bible and the quiet voice I kept hearing in my head. It was the fulfilment of my childhood dreams. And then came the excuses. When you sign up for a new insurance policy, reading it may be very reassuring. You feel protected. It seems that every unfortunate event in your life will be covered. But attached to the policy is also the fine print, an endless list of clauses that allow the insurance company to bail out on coverage in numerous, and often quite surprising, situations. Reading the fine print can leave you very disillusioned, and you may start wondering if the policy actually covers anything at all, and that's why most of the people skip reading it altogether. 
Pentecostal Christianity offers exactly this kind of policy for your life. It's full of promises about what God's supposed to do for you, both in this life and in the next. He'll answer your prayers, he'll guide you, he'll protect you, he'll give you wisdom, strength and abundance of everything you will ever need. All of these promises are more or less directly derived from the Bible, which is treated as inspired and literally infallible. But when you live this kind of life for a few years, you start noticing that, more often than not, these promises fail to materialise. You begin collecting answered prayers because they're so rare. You notice that bad things happen to you as frequently as to your non-believing friends. You make bad decisions thinking that God had told you to make them, only to realise you must have heard him wrong. You cannot turn to buy it. You cannot turn a blind eye anymore to prophecies that failed to become fulfilled, to miraculous healings that were promised but never happened, to people for whom you prayed so hard but were never saved, and dozens of other situations where the Bible promises you something, but you never get it. So what do you do then? You start building excuses, the fine print of your Pentecostal personal theology. Some excuses are found in the Bible itself. Even more are just passed around in countless sermons and other elements of Christian culture. God will answer your prayers, sure, except when he won't because you don't have enough faith. Or when they're not, or when they are, or because they are not consistent with his will. Or because his perfect time hasn't happened yet. Or because you have selfish motives for praying, or because of countless other reasons often made up on the spot. God will protect you from evil, sure, except when he won't because he wants to teach you a lesson, or because he has different plans for you and you don't understand them. God will heal the sick, feed the hungry, save the lost, sure, except when he won't. The fine print keeps accumulating up to the point where you're not really sure what to expect anymore. Perhaps I could have kept up with the excuses for much longer if they weren't so poorly and inconsistently defined. I could have understood that God doesn't want to answer prayers which are inconsistent with his will if there was any simple way to know what his will is and what it isn't, but there is none. You're supposed to let the Spirit guide you, study the Bible, and learn to listen to the voice of Jesus on your heart, but you never know for sure if you heard it right or read the Bible right. The same for every other excuse. How are you supposed to know when you have enough faith or not? How are you supposed to know if your motives are pure enough? You're left with this constant guessing, expecting less and less from God until your faith is reduced to some intellectual conviction with no discernible bearing on reality. This wasn't what I signed up for. All of these dilemmas would be easily resolved if only God spoke clearly about something. This is what I spent countless years praying for, that God would answer some simple question of mine. What does he think of me doing this or that? What does he want me to do in this or that situation? Why am I supposed to waste years on guessing when he could resolve everything in seconds? I spent nights and days pleading him to answer just one question, just say one word, anything would do. But he kept silent. In the end, the one thing that did it for me was observing, as a pastor, how Christians leave their lives when they think no one is watching. Because if there was one fundamental promise of Christianity I kept sticking to after years of disappointment, it was that God is changing people's lives. I could live with God not giving me daily bread and not delivering me from evil. After all, it could always be because of his perfect heavenly plan that I'm just too limited to comprehend. But the one thing I thought the Bible is clear about is that he's supposed to change people for the better. Maybe not instantly, maybe not completely, not in this life anyway, but by the power of the Holy Spirit people should be transformed into the glory of Christ, becoming better, more compassionate, more moral, more Christ-like. But nothing like that happens. In church, they just learn how to masquerade better. This was the final straw, the ultimate promise of the Bible that turned out to be false too. The whole house of theological fine print finally collapsed. Leaving faith in personal God was an unimaginable relief. For the first time in my life, the world started to make sense without resorting to hundreds of self-contradicting excuses. For the first time, I found a worldview that matches the world as it is, not as I wanted it to be. I don't have to fight facts anymore. I don't have to find excuses for God anymore. This whole big layer of spirituality, which was supposed to be comforting, turned out to be simply confusing. The world is much more beautiful when you're actually able to understand it. So those words are from Michael Pleban, an ex-Pentecostal pastor, um, and it's on the Clergy Project, for current and former religious professionals without supernatural beliefs. So I'm going to go back to there in future shows and find other stories about the troubles as well that people had once they left their religion. Something I'll talk about briefly, I was going to read bits and pieces of it, but I don't like talking too long, maybe I'll play a song and come back to this, is the Freedom of Thought Report. 
So it's a worldwide survey of discrimination and persecution against humanists, atheists and non-religious published by Humanists International. And so it's got an entry. They say for every country in the world. What they actually mean is every country, I believe, with the UN presence. So New Zealand is bundled up with a couple of small Pacific islands. And it's a little bit hard to tease apart which bits in the New Zealand entry are New Zealand and which bits are those Pacific islands. We're not quite sure. So I'm going to avoid reading the New Zealand entry anyway. Um, and we'll look at other countries. In future episodes, episodes of the show, let's go with episodes. In future shows future episodes. We're also going to look at atheist refugees. There are several people who are in danger of being killed if they stay in their own country and they seek refuge in other countries. There are a few in New Zealand that the Humanist Society is supporting, so I'm going to try and interview them or at least tell part of their story so we can find out about what it's like in their original country, why they're seeking refuge, what that process has been like, um, dealing with the New Zealand Immigration Service and all of those people who, as New Zealanders, we don't have to deal with most of the time. So the next track I'm going to play, I have this on my playlist today, so I might play this next track and then come back and call it a night. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I'm going to have to search for it, sadly, because I'm slightly less organised than I wanted to be. But that's okay. While I'm searching, also... A useful thing to do in a show about humanism is to define humanism. What I'm going to do is read out the definition from Wikipedia. Humanism, like many terms, has different meanings for different people. In lack of anything else, Wikipedia is a good place to start to look at how some people describe it, but every humanist will have their own meaning. So. Humanism is a philosophical stance that emphasises the value and agency of human beings individually and collectively. The meaning of the term humanism has fluctuated according to the successive intellectual movements which have identified with it. Generally, however, humanism refers to a perspective that affirms some notion of human freedom and progress. It views humanity as responsible for the promotion and development of individuals, espouses the equal and inherent dignity of all human beings, and emphasises a concern for humans in relation to the world. In modern times, humanist movements are typically non-religious movements aligned with secularism. Secularism. It's Sunday night, I'm having trouble with words today. I'm sure we'll survive. So in modern times, humanist movements are typically non-religious movements aligned with secularism. Secular, secularism. And today, humanism may refer to a non-theistic life stance centred on human agency and looking to science rather than revelation from a supernatural source to understand the world. Right, let me see if I can find the song that I want to play. I should have really done this beforehand, but we will survive, I think. Right, now I remember the name of the song. Here we go. So this is one of my... One of my top 50 artists. I like a lot of music. He may be in the top five. I've already played something by him tonight. I played White Wine in the Sun earlier. This track I'm going to play is another classic of his. It's Tim Minchin as the artist if you hadn't figured that out already. This is going to be the last track I'm going to play tonight, then we're going to call it a night. This show will be repeated next week from 8 till 9, and then I'll come back for a new one on the first Sunday of every month thereafter. I hope you've had a lovely weekend, I hope March has treated you well so far, and enjoy Thank You God by Tim Minchin. We had our church, Sam, Sam and his mum went to an evangelical church in Dandenong, just, just south of Melbourne there, and she went there that Sunday. And the entire congregation prayed for, for his mum. And the next Tuesday, that she went to the doctor and her eye was completely healed, uh, as if nothing had ever been wrong. And I had asked for evidence, you know, and this was the first time I'd ever had a first-person account of, of, of a miracle. So I really 
really uh, had an impact on me and I went home and uh, wrote this song. I have an apology to make I'm afraid I've made a big mistake I turn my face away from you, Lord I was too blind to see the light I was too weak to feel your mind I closed my eyes, I couldn't see the truth, Lord But then like Saul on the Damascus Road You sent a messenger to me and so now I've had the truth revealed to me Please forgive me all those things I said I no longer betray you, Lord I will pray to you instead And I will say thank you, thank you Thank you, God Thank you, thank you Thank you, God Thank you, God, for fixing the cataracts of Sam's mom I had no idea, but it's suddenly so clear Now I feel such a cynic, how could I have been so dumb? Thank you for displaying how praying works A particular prayer in a particular church Thank you, Sam, for the chance to acknowledge this Omnipotent ophthalmologist Thank you, God, for fixing the cataracts of Sam's mum I didn't realize that it was so simple But you've shown a great example of just how it can be done You only need to pray in a particular spot To a particular version of a particular God And if you pull that off without a hitch He will fix one eye of one middle class white bitch I know in the past my outlook has been limited I couldn't see examples of where life had been definitive But I can admit it when the evidence is clear As clear as Sam's mom's new cornea Extremely clear. Thank you, God, for fixing the cataracts of Sam's mom. I have to admit that in the past I have been skeptical, but Sam described this miracle and I am overcome. How fitting that the sighting of a sight based intervention should open my eyes to this exciting new dimension. It's like someone put an eye chart up in front of me and the top five letters say I C G O D. Thank you, Sam, for showing how my point of view has been so flawed. I assume there was no God at all, but now I see that cynical It's simply that his interests aren't particularly broad He's largely undiverted by the starving masses Or the inequality between the various classes He gives out strictly limited passes Redeemable for surgery or two for one glasses I feel so shocking for historically mocking you Your interests are clearly confined to the ocular I bet given the chance you just chew the divine And start a little business selling contacts online Fuck me, Sam, what are the odds that of history's endless parade of gods that the god who just happened to be taught to believe in is the actual one? And he digs on healing, but not the AIDS ridden African nations, nor the victims of the plague, nor the flat adult Asians, but healthy, privately insured Australians with common and curable corneal degeneration. The story of Sam's has but a single explanation A surgical god who digs on magic operations No, it couldn't be mistaken Attribution of causation Born of a coincidental temporal correlation Exacerbated by a general lack of education Vis-a-vis -vis physics in Sam's parish congregation And it couldn't be that all these pious people are liars Couldn't be an artifact of confirmation bias A product of groupthink, a mass delusion An emperor's new clothes style fear of exclusion No, it's more likely to be an all-powerful magician Than the mystery Diagnosis of the initial condition Or one of many cases of spontaneous remission Or a record-keeping glitch by the local physician Not the only explanation for Sam's mum seeing They prayed to an all-knowing super being To the omnipresent master of the universe And he quite liked the sound of their muttered verse So for a bit of a change from his usual stunt Of being a sexist, racist, murderous cunt He popped down to Dan and Ogden just like that Used his powers to heal the cataracts Sing the cataracts of Sam's mom I didn't realize that it was such a simple thing I feel such a ding-a-ling, what ignorant scum Now I understand how 
prayer can work A particular prayer in a particular church In a particular style with a particular stuff And for particular problems that aren't particularly tough And for particular people Preferably white and for particular senses Preferably sight A particular prayer in a particular spot To a particular version of a particular God And if you get that right He does mine Take a break from giving babies malaria And pop down to your local area To fix the cataracts of 